Between 1995 and 1996, a killer would commit a crime that would shock the quiet and peaceful community of Abbotsford, British Columbia, where crimes like the one we're going to talk about today just don't happen. In a good old fashioned game of cat and mouse, the killer would keep everybody on edge with taunting phone calls to the police and an act carried out in broad daylight that was not only a deliberate slap in the face to law enforcement, but also the victims and their families. Now, Abbotsford, I've been through there. Even though it's large enough, it's got a very small town vibe, farming community, lots of churches. It's actually referred to as the Bible Belt of BC. People just trusted each other. Locking your door, come on. Going for a late night stroll past to sundown, what's the worry? Abbotsford is also decently close to Vancouver. I think it's about an hour outside of downtown Vancouver. At around 7.30 a.m. on October 14th, two fishermen were casting their rods out in the Vetter Canal it was about 15 kilometers outside of Abbotsford between Chilliwack and Abbotsford. And they come across the body of a young woman or teen. She was naked and appeared to have been mutilated to some degree. The police quickly got there and right away they could tell foul play was involved. I mean, this woman had been clearly beaten savagely. They were able to extract DNA uh, in the form of semen and they quickly found her clothes which had been hung in nearby bush bushes and trees. Whoever this killer was, you know, he wanted them to see that. That was a deliberate display. And also keep that display thing in mind for later because that's going to be a common theme with this guy. 16-year-olds Misty Cockrell and Tanya Smith uh, were best friends. They attended the same high school together. They did a lot of things together. And this night, they were at a house party, October the 13th, Friday the 13th. And as they were leaving the party, they get some friends to drive them back to Misty's house. And when they get back to her place, they know that their friend who lives about five blocks away is having a birthday party. And they want to keep that fun train rolling. So they set out on foot. Let's go to the next party. As they're walking over there, they actually start to like talk about how it's Friday the 13th. And they say stuff along the lines of, oh my God, it's Friday the 13th. What if something like bad happens? Not too long after that, as they're walking by this big hedge, a man jumps out of nowhere with a big aluminum baseball bat and says, quote, you bitch want a party? As the girls are basically frozen in fear, he grabs both of them and shoves them through the bushes to the other side of the bushes and tells them to get on the ground and get undressed. Tanya ends up doing just that, but Misty is just like still. She can't even process what's going on or react. Misty actually attempted to fake an asthma attack to throw him off and like stall him for a second, but he unfortunately saw right through that and was like, I don't see no puffer thing. And that's when Misty just complained. As he begins to sexually assault Tanya, he momentarily sets the bat down on the ground. Misty immediately sees this, and, you know, she could have easily made a break for it if she wanted to, but she didn't want to leave her friend, so she picks the bat up, takes a big home run swing at the guy, tagging him pretty good in the shoulder, but he was quickly able to wrestle the bat out of her hands, and he ends up repeatedly striking her in the head until she's completely just out cold. As Misty's unconscious, he goes goes back over to Tanya and repeatedly assaults her and beats her with the bat, eventually making a short drive over to the Vedder River and just tossing her into the river. It was determined later that she was alive when he threw her into the river and her official cause of death was drowning. A couple hours go by and Misty wakes up and she's face down in the dirt. She looks around, sees that her friend Tanya is nowhere to be seen and as she gets to her feet, she feels a, an extremely warm sensation coming out of her ear which uh, was blood and apparently spinal fluid. Luckily this attack actually took place basically right next to the hospital. So Misty was able to muster the strength to stumble over to the hospital. She really had no idea how bad her injuries were. She had a broken arm, broken fingers, skull fractures, and what was described as a fist-sized hole in her head. It's a miracle she even made it to the hospital. When she saw her reflection in the mirror, she just, she just passed out right there. Once Misty had been operated on and was recovering in her hospital, bed. The police brought in a sketch artist to just 
ask Misty what she remembered. She couldn't really remember too much, but it resulted in this sketch. A couple days after the attack, as the police are gearing up to release that composite sketch to the public, they receive a phone call from a man basically saying, hey guys, just thought you should be aware, I'm the dude that drove Misty to the hospital after that terrible attack the other day. Well, we all know that Misty never got a ride, and when they pressed the unknown caller on his identity and asked him to come in for an interview, he just said, nah, and hung up the phone. Then a few days later, they receive a call with a much more sinister tone. This time, the killer makes it very clear that he knows a whole lot about the crime and mentions a bite mark. Just to let me know who I am, Tanya's right there. Really good. The reason that was so significant is because the bite mark was something that had not been broadcast to the public yet, and only something law enforcement and the killer would know. Police immediately traced that call to a phone booth in Abbotsford. They gun it over there, but of course they're too late and the killer is nowhere to be seen. They bring in the forensics team to do their thing and, you know, dust for prints, but again, they don't get anything there either. Then a few hours later, this call. You think I would be stupid enough to leave fingerprints behind when I make a I'm the one that's just giving you the chance to try and find me. I'll be cruising around looking for someone else. They traced that call to another Abbotsford payphone, but again, nothing. And that's when the phone calls went quiet for a bit. Although the police had a sketch, they had his DNA, they had his voice, you know, semen, saliva, all that stuff, they didn't actually really have a lot to go on. All they knew was that they were dealing with a guy who clearly enjoyed messing with them. And also a man that not only showed no remorse, but also a guy who was clearly proud of what he had done and wanted to rub it in their face. Police know that in general, but especially with a guy like this, there was a high likelihood that, you know, this type of a person would want to attend the funeral of the victim. So police attended Tanya's funeral and they took a good look at everybody, but they didn't see anything out of the ordinary. But. We'll circle back to that in a bit. On Halloween night, 1995, this is about two weeks after the last call, he calls again and, you know, he goes over some of the same stuff again, but he really wants to hit home on the point that he's gonna strike again. Wants to attack and kill more girls. Police trace that to yet another Abbotsford phone booth and again, they don't find anything, but they do get a statement from a witness that did not make out who was in the phone booth, but described a beige car parked outside of the phone booth when when the person was in there on the call. Now the police had really tried everything they could while still holding some of those cards, uh, you know, like the evidence they weren't telling to the public, but Abbotsford was in a constant state of fear by this point. Girls didn't want to leave the house, like it was bad. And the cops said, okay, uh, we've got to try something different here. We might have to release some of our cards. So they decide to release little snippets of the phone calls to the public so the public could hear the man's voice and possibly identify him. Police also circled back to Misty, who was now at home and feeling a lot better, and they brought in another sketch artist to see if she could give a more detailed account, which resulted in this updated sketch. Police actually ruled out thousands of suspects in this case, and now with the new sketch out and the voice recordings, they were receiving tips just non-stop. And that's gotta be stressful as hell as a cop because, you know, you're happy that these tips are coming in, but any of those calls could also just be the killer. So that's great. Police actually did feel quite good about one guy who had been called in multiple times by people and was a criminal and he had a past and everything. He fit the bill. But they put him in a police lineup and Misty didn't pick him. And when they took his DNA, it was not a match. Yet another dead end. The killer who was watching everything unfold at home, he knew that he had to lay low and, you know, maybe he would get lucky and somebody would take the fall for this. But regardless, the one thing he knew was that the heat was on and the calls stopped dead. By the following year, February 1996, the case is as cold as ever and everybody just kind of wondered, 
Where did he go? Heck, he was just so chatty. The cops eventually try something out of left field. They start talking to these local news outlets and they start to construct stories that they put in the paper and on the news, basically to the tune of, eh, that killer from a few months ago, gone, probably moved somewhere. He's definitely not a threat to Abbotsford anymore. That's for dang sure. Well, let's just say that worked. One February morning, the killer would make his presence very known. Of course, we all know that killers sometimes like to take take an object uh, or piece of evidence and place it somewhere and tell the cops, hey, go look at that. Look at how evil and cunning I am. But I've never seen or heard of a killer doing anything like this. On February 17th, the local Abbotsford radio station called Radio Max was on the air. They were taking live calls with people and all of a sudden a man phones in. There's no hey, how you doing or anything like that. All the man says is you should check the Radio Max car in the parking lot. So the host goes outside and he immediately sees that there's something big heavy looking on the hood of the car as he walked closer it became obvious what it was it was the tombstone of tanya smith that had been ripped from her grave the soil still caked all over the bottom he had a bunch of stuff written on the tombstone basically along the lines of tanya's not gonna be the last victim there's gonna be more you know you're not gonna catch me and even makes a threat that he's gonna come after misty to finish the job he also referenced the bite mark again just to make it clear just think Think about how messed up that is for a second. I've just never seen anything like that in a true crime case. This guy, this is broad daylight in the morning, populated enough area, and he just walks up, plops this tombstone on the hood of the car. People should have seen him, but no one saw him. It was like they were chasing a ghost at this point. Only a couple days later, guess who called again? They go to the payphone, same thing as usual. They don't find any evidence the killer's gone, but they again talk to a witness who sort of saw somebody in the phone booth and the description that they gave kind of matched the composite sketch. She did tell them about a beige car parked outside the phone booth. A couple days later, a call comes in from a woman claiming that she was just relaxing in her house when a wrench came hurling through her window. Police get there and establish that it is indeed a wrench with a little blue envelope taped to it with the words from the killer written across it. This letter was just him bragging that he'd committed three other sexual assaults. I guess he wanted to mix his communication style up with the pick a random house and hit him with the old wrench letter, but this is the moment where he finally slipped up a little bit. They of course found no print on the envelope or the letter, but when they checked the tape that was used to tape the envelope to the wrench, a print, finally! After entering that print into the National Canadian Database and the US Criminal Record Database, uh, no matches. This was probably, I'd say, the lowest point in the investigation for the police. Now they had everything from his prints to his DNA to his literal voice to the potential car he was driving all that they had everything but at the same time they had nothing that's when they decide ah what the hell let's remaster the audio and just re-release it to the public and that's just what they do on april 30th and voila a breakthrough only about a couple hours after they played those audio recordings the case would take some might say an unexpected twist a woman calls into the tip line and says that sounds like my son. 31-year-old Terry Driver was born January 25th, 1965. I think he had three siblings. He was actually the son of a decorated Vancouver police officer, uh, which is an interesting fact. At just two, he was diagnosed with a minor brain abnormality, some small evidence of brain damage, basically. He was a troubled kid uh, with not very good impulse control uh, and behaviors, basically right out the gate. We're talking by the age of five, his parents had tapped out and just sent him to live in a care facility. He was there for some time, like I think he got out around 10 or 11 years old to now divorced parents he went to stay with his dad. And he pretty much just picked up right where he left off, but now he was older and smarter and he was still very violent, started hurting people, kids, 
cats and dogs and committing petty crimes and just all sorts of terrible things. However, despite all that, he kind of tried to pull it together as he reached adulthood and he got a job at this printing place and he started doing that for a living and he eventually meets his wife as a young man and they have two kids. One little hobby that Terry enjoyed, maybe because his dad was a cop or he was just morbidly fascinated with uh, police work, uh, he was what they call a scanner chaser, which basically means uh, these people that listen to police scanners and then they go tail the police to the crime scene, kick back with popcorn. Now flash forward to Terry's mom on the tip line with police telling them about her son. She said she heard the tapes and ran it by the rest of the family and everybody resoundingly was like, yep, that's Terry. You gotta respect that they just sold him out instantaneously. Terry's mom also did confirm to police that he indeed attended the funeral with his two kids. She also described an incident where Terry got into an argument with the whole family at like a dinner or something and was just like, don't f with me. You don't even know who I am anymore. You don't even know what I'm capable of. Which sounds like something a teenager would say, but also a cold-blooded murderer. So armed with that, the police head on over to Terry's house and wait for him to get off work. And as he pulls into the driveway, guess what they see? The beige car. They told him that somebody identified him as the Abbotsford killer. They didn't want to tell him that it was his mom because like, if he wasn't the killer and they told him that his mom accused him of being the Abbotsford killer, that, you know, that could ruin a Christmas or two. But also, if he was the killer, her life could be in danger if they had to release him for some reason or they couldn't arrest him. After refusing to give any evidence and turning down an interview, I guess they didn't have, you know, a warrant to arrest him or anything like that. Terry hopped on the phone with his boss at the printing company, who was also kind of his buddy. And he was like, hey, you remember that psycho that left the tombstone at the radio station? Yeah, they think that's me. They want me to give all this evidence. I mean, I don't know. What do you think I should do? And his boss said, well, if you got nothing to do with it, what do you got to hide? Why don't you go down there and talk to him? So Terry said, you know what? Fine. I think Terry was pretty confident. He went down there with his lawyer. He knew what type of evidence the police had. In his mind, he knew. He thought, you know, they had the DNA, they had some saliva from his bite, they had his semen. But the one thing he just knew in his heart, and he even taunted them in one of the calls over this, they didn't have his print, but they did have his print. So when he goes in for the interview, he says, nah, to all the DNA stuff. But he says, well, yeah, I'll give you my prints, why not? Ping, ping. It was an instant match, and they soon linked him to all the other pieces of evidence. Terry and his legal team, they, uh, you know, they went with an interesting defense. Terry's story was that uh, another attacker attacked the girls, and he just happened to stumble across them, and because he's got such terrible impulse control, he could not stop himself from assaulting the girls. And midway through assaulting Tanya, he realizes that she's not breathing anymore, and says to him, Oh my god, they're gonna think I did this. My DNA and everything is all over the scene. He says he panicked and just took her to that river and disposed of her there. He also said that he drove Misty to the hospital, which, I mean, come on. As you could imagine, that all went down in flames, and Terry Driver was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for 25 years, and he just passed away last year from natural causes at the age of 56. Years after his sentence, by the way, they actually convicted him on two of those sexual assaults that he bragged about doing in the letter that he threw through that woman's window. Just want to say thank you guys for watching all the way through this video if you did. Uh, this case is just insane from top to bottom, and I really hope that I did it justice. I'd also really appreciate it if you could just absolutely annihilate both the like and the subscribe button. And until next time, ta-ta for now.